Dear Father, je vsebi pomaže Bog in Hristos vzkrese. Bog vam pomaga, bo istina v vzkrese. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation from Foundation Irmos for this uh, interactive talk. I am uh, really glad that you accepted and uh, it's a really a great, great honor to have you online. Uh, we met uh, back in 2005 when I moved uh, to Groningen, the Netherlands, for my PhD studies. And uh, a week later, I discovered uh, a Russian Orthodox Church in the downtown of the city. Uh, where I met a uh, very interesting uh, multinational uh, church with, uh, uh, if you will, uh, uh, great energy. And uh, I met uh, you and your brother, Father Onufri. And uh, when I left uh, Groningen four years later, I uh, brought great memories from, uh, from that time and from that church. So when I discovered that uh, you and your brother are uh, actually monks and are actually Dutch monks. I was uh, slightly shocked, let's say. So I sure. don't really, <laughs> I don't really know much about uh, your life. What I know is that uh, you have a Dutch and uh, Indonesian ancestry, and that you are uh, an Orthodox monk. So can you please uh, give us a journey through your life, uh, starting from the early beginning? Yes, I can. Um... Uh, my brother and I, we were both born in a family um, which has uh, Dutch Indonesian uh, descendants. So um, this is because our country uh, used to have a very huge colony in Southeast Asia, which is nowadays called the Republic of Indonesia. It's in uh, one of the biggest Muslim countries. Uh, the Dutch were there from about the 17th century. And there always had been a, a small European Dutch population to govern the, the colony and to, to work in the, the main uh, industries uh, and, and of course uh, uh, mer merchant, merchant yet as well, and, and army. So there has always been, uh, for about 400 years, Dutch people in this colony. And we are descendants of these Dutch people mixed up with uh, uh, Indonesian blood. So my brother is more the white side and I'm the dark side of it. So it's, people, people don't recognize that we are brothers, but we have many kinds of these Dutch Indonesian families in Holland. And most of them you even don't recognize because lately people coming from more dark countries than, than this. So many people don't see any difference. When I go, for instance, to Serbia, they think I'm Serbian. Or when I go to Greece, they even think I'm from Crete or something. And uh, so they don't ask me questions about my orthodoxy because I look orthodox. Uh, so we were born. Uh, uh, both in this family and my parents were born in former uh, Dutch, uh, this former Dutch uh, Indian colony. And half of our family, uh, brothers and sisters, we were with nine brothers and sisters, small monastery, and uh, I have five sisters and uh, four, and we are and three brothers, with me four brothers. And half of the family was born in the Connolly and the other side of the world. And the other half was born in Holland. So we have uh, several part of this decolonization history in our family. Um, my, my parents were born and raised in colonial, colonial circumstances, far away from Europe. They learned Dutch. They had books connected with uh, Dutch impressions, etc. And uh, they could speak the local language as well. So we heard some of these local words as well. And, uh, but when the war came and the Japanese occupation, my father had to go into the army 
and he stayed for four years as a prisoner of war, which was very difficult, of course. And uh, the Japanese were very cruel. And uh, my mother had to stay at home without any income. So uh, thanks to the, thank God to the relief of uh, family, she, she, she could survive. And uh, immediately uh, after the war, and already prepared by the Japanese, a, a very uh, furious uh, uh, revolution started for independence. And so uh, they kicked the Dutch out by war, by uh, an independence war. And uh, very strange, immediately after the liberation of the Netherlands, the government organized a war against the independence uh, movement in Indonesia. So young soldiers just leaving war, they were sent into war again to Indonesia, if you can imagine. And uh, uh, many of them died over there. And, uh, but we were in between the Indonesians and the Dutch. We were connected with, uh, with, with the Dutch, of course. So the uh, Indonesian uh, uh, independent movement people from them, they were attacking us because we, in, in their sight, they, we were symbol of the colonial suppressor. suppressor. And uh, so we had to leave Indonesia. Uh, so my parents did. And uh, they arrived in 1951 in uh, the Netherlands. And uh, together with many, many other people from uh, the, this former uh, republic, uh, this former colony. And, uh, and so we were, we were the first immigration uh, uh, wave, you could say, because we were about 400 to, to half a million people. Um, in, at that time, Holland had about uh, 12 million uh, inhabitants, small country, but we were dispersed uh, over the country. And we came to live in the northern part of Holland. Uh, my parents, religiously speaking, were Roman Catholics. That is to say, my mother, from, uh, she was raised as a Protestant girl. Uh, but by marrying my father, she, she became Roman Catholic. And so we arrived here in the northern part of the Netherlands and uh, we went here to school. Uh, we were raised in a, in a Catholic way. But you have to realize that the northern part of the Netherlands is very Protestant. Uh, whereas the southern part of the Netherlands is very Catholic. At that time, I'm not talking about nowadays, it all changed after the secularization of the society. And this northern part where we were living in, there were only few, uh, you might say, concentrations of, uh, of uh, Roman Catholics, mainly in the, in, the, in, the, in the towns. And we lived in the town. Uh, first in a little town called Snake, where I was born, and my brother, Father Nufri, also, and later in the capital of our province, uh, Leeuwarden. So this is when I, uh, these are the main features of our youth, yeah. And uh, after this um, studying here, um, uh, I, in the end, decided to study uh, sociology at the University of uh, Groningen. And I finished uh, sociology. And um, uh, in this time, I got connected with orthodoxy in the city of Groningen, the church you know very well. And uh, this church was not yet there. Uh, the parish was, at that time, uh, using a small Catholic chapel on the Roman Catholic uh, cemetery. And I got acquainted with Autosdy over there. And my brother was already going to this church. So in this way, 
I got acquainted with uh, orthodoxy, but still was not yet orthodox at that time. Um, yeah, then you could ask you how, how was it becoming, how did I become orthodox? Well, all good things, they, 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 uh, good things connected with, with, uh, with God today, of course, uh, have their uh, uh, peculiar problems. Um, I remember at that time, when I got acquainted with orthodoxy, I just was in a phase uh, trying to go deeper into my own religious background, so Roman Catholicism. And uh, I was a member, an active member of the Roman Catholic parish, and even had some functions in the, in the, in the local community of Catholics uh, as a member of a board, etc. And, um, and I remember uh, talking with my brother. My brother was not to, uh, telling so much about orthodoxy. He had just said to me, well, if you want to know, just read. <laughs> he advised me some books to read. So I did. And, uh, but it was always, in a way, in, uh, uh, it made me very curious, first of all, about uh, the, the differences between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. And uh, when I started reading about the history of our church, of our Orthodox churches, I then found out, I really, I, I remember, I was telling myself, how is this possible? that they uh, didn't inform me about the real history of uh, Christianity. I mean, uh, uh, we, always, we were always told that uh, the great schism uh, had two churches uh, went apart, orthodoxy this side, or this. But uh, it looks as if uh, they just split up. But it's not a matter of splitting up. It was a matter that the oldest church said, we are continuing in our uh, uh, orthodox tradition as the fathers did uh, already many, many years before us. And you, I mean, Rome, you go your own way. And this is the way I'm now explaining to people coming, for instance, to the monastery here when they are asking about orthodoxy and the differences between Roman Catholicism, etc. And even Protestant, when you say, well, you were even from farther away. <laughs> so it's, uh, but, and very simple things uh, convince them about these things. For instance, when I'm telling them, especially Catholics, they use the word uh, Eucharist. And they use the word liturgy. And I ask them, do you know where this word come from? Do you think it's Latin? And then they look at me and say, no, it is Greek. So your church, how, how can your Latin church have Greek words? Or, uh, and then when I tell him, my brothers are coming, say, who has been in Greece for many? Say, yeah, 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 yeah. What do you say when you say, thank you very much in Greece, in Greek? And some know, some don't know. Ephoristopoli. Uh, this is the word, Eucharistie, this is from the Greek. And it's so very plain things from daily life can explain them what is the beginning and where are you going to. And these things, uh, well, I, I, uh, I myself, when I became Orthodox, realized these things. And in a way, I'm giving this to people coming here knowing more about Orthodoxy. So this is uh, how things uh, happen. Of course, it's uh, it's uh, here where I'm now. This is uh, this is a monastery. Well, it's I'm living alone. There's only one monk right now, and it's already for twenty years. And I hope God will give me uh, not too much brothers, but <laughs> but uh, some brothers. Uh, actually, there has. There have been uh, there has been already one uh, person taking the monastic vows here. I was already preparing him for several years, but the bishop took him from the monastery. He, yeah, he needs him. Well, you know this. You have this situation in Serbia yourself. 
But there you have many monasteries. I know them. Fushka Gora and, and uh, uh, of Chabanya. And it's close to Chachak. I've been there too. And the monasteries is very, very nice. And in the south, there have been many monasteries. So Kochani, Georgius Tupavi, Tsenareka, Biotama. Yeah, it, it's very, very, very um, interesting, of course. Um, and like I wrote you in the last letter, the, the interesting thing is I'm here. I've, I'm, I'm sometimes, like I wrote you, I, I feel like fighting uh, as a soldier in the front line of secularism and at the same time being in the backyard of orthodoxy and like um, uh, of course this cannot be done without blessing you cannot do this without the blessing of course of our of a church our bishops but it's the blessing of the people it's the uh, the people who we have orthodox people living in uh, in uh, in uh, the Netherlands, like you, you, you've seen in, uh, in our church in Groningen. And, uh, uh, well, there are not only in Groningen, but there are more uh, Orthodox parishes in our country. And we even have a monastery, uh, a women monastery, which was already founded uh, 75 years ago. And it was blessed by Saint John uh, Maximovich. So, uh, Vladiko Saint John of uh, Shanghai and San Francisco. He blessed the monastery, the, the first Orthodox monastery in our country. And I've seen, uh, uh, yeah, you might call them relics of him. His Oblachenia is still in this monastery. His uh, Royanica is still in the mon monastery. His, his uh, uh, Mitra is in the monastery. So it's, it's uh, and I've been talking with the monks, they already uh, passed away, but I was talking with the monks who were there, who knew him personally. They were talking about him, and they said it was very difficult to talk because he's uh, talking, he, 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 he cannot uh, speak very, very well, uh, Saint, uh, Saint John. But his deeds were very, very, very clear. And uh, so in a way, there is the, these blessings of, of all these uh, saints uh, if of course the old saints before the great schism and uh, this is a very interesting thing the old saints because when we arrived in this village here here's a map of the region where i'm now and here is water this is the old north sea this is now a very huge lake because they built a, a dam, a dike. We are very good at building dikes here in the Netherlands. I remember. <laughs> now it's, it's, it's a lake. And here are many, many uh, uh, smaller lakes. And I live in this area. And here is our monastery. Oh, this is a new map. We used to have a map with an Orthodox cross on it. But anyway, here in this village is our monastery. So very close to the border. And... Uh, Already in the in the ninth century, after Christ, of course, there were uh, Christian missionaries from the old church. Of course, they were connected with with Rome, but it was before the schism. And uh, according uh, uh, the tradition, which started with uh, Saint John Maximovich of uh, Shanghai and San Francisco. He said, you have, to, uh, you have to pay attention to these old saints. And uh, we knew about this when I was, during my monastic life in the Orthodox Church in Poland, I was always thinking about this. And uh, when we started here, this small monastery in this village, I uh, asked Father Anufri, um, uh, do you know something about these old saints here? And here in this village, there used to be in the Middle Ages uh, a monastery dedicated to 
to us in the Orthodox Church, unknown saint, Saint Odolf. He lived in the ninth century. So I said to his father, let's, let's look up in the Jivot Sviatich, in the uh, and uh, find out his name and and uh, and his date and about his life. So we were just a few days here in the, in this monastery, and and I opened the page, and I said to Father, "Do you know it's on the twelfth of June his date? This is the same date as the as the feast date of Saint Onufrius the Great, which is the uh, the name Father Onufri received when he came into uh, when he paid to vows as a monastic. So we were both we we thought, oh dear, here is something happening which we didn't knew. And uh, the saints, like they are preparing something for us, so they those brothers have to go there and we we we. Uh, Upstairs there, high up, they, they, they probably made some kind of arrangement between this old wolf and St. Onufri. And now I'm here. And by the help of God, uh, we started 20 years ago with a small uh, monastery church. I'm living here and I assisting also in the parish of Groningen and uh, I have other uh, pastoral uh, works as an author, work as Orthodox priest. But in the meantime, uh, people are coming here, and there is a small community now. And uh, we even have the uh, opportunity to to buy a house just next to the church. And probably this soon will uh, Akuboda. Uh, uh, Will soon will have this uh, this house, and so we decided when we receive this house, we will uh, name it after this Saint Odolf. And then history is repeating itself because here used to be a monastery dedicated to him. And look, Orthodox monks coming from where they coming here, and then they they uh, um, they bring in a way. Uh, Christianity, but in the original, in the in, in its pure form, they bring it back again into this uh, country. Yeah, it's not for us to 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 be proud of, but it's especially it is it is the work of the Holy Spirit, and we just like tools in 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 their hands. And uh, although although we try to, of course, there's where lacking a lot and uh, there's a lot of things of which we should be even ashamed and uh, we are people as well and uh, by praying by uh, of course serving the services we, we we can do we started from here uh, small orthodox pilgrimages and uh, yeah, it, it's all already here, and now uh, we are blessed by, yeah, by in a way by these things which are uh, happening now about, for instance, this house of which you were talking about. And nothing happens without prayer. Nothing happens without uh, spiritual endeavors. Uh, yeah, it's, and of course, even if you do this, you should not think that. The more I pray, the more I will get. It doesn't work like this way. It is, it is the, the inner mind. I don't know how to how to say. It. It's the attitude you you have to work on, and even you're working on it. It's not you're working on it. Exactly. It's like uh, in the Gospels we have to read in 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 these in these days. Christ is. Every time was studying, I am the bread from heaven, and people who are taking from this bread, he will never leave. And he he said to us, he will uh, be with us, and he promised us eternity. So, what should be afraid? Or should, or which should be afraid of? It's it's it's. Uh, but still, we are people. We have our 
anxieties, we have our passions, we have our uh, things of which we uh, feel sorrowful or, uh, well, I like nowadays, all these problems with the uh, coronavirus, etc. All these things happen right now, too. And, uh, and we are only a very, very small Orthodox community here. Yeah. But still, I'm also working in uh, in a uh, in some prisons here in Holland. That is to say, the Ministry of Justice asked me to to see for the Orthodox prisoners. Yeah, there are even Orthodox prisoners here. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank God, not that many, but we have them, and. Uh, and some come from Serbia. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's very hard to say. Uh, they are far away from their home countries, and uh, when they see me, then I realize the mission we have here, because they instead of many Dutch people, they don't recognize me as an Orthodox monk, but they immediately see this is an Orthodox priest. And uh, of course, not, not all prisoners are that uh, connected with church and church life, but when they don't know, other prisoners will inform them. So immediately there's something happening over there. I remember once I was just walking on a corridor in a, in a, in a, in a, in a department of the prison and I was just walking there and then behind me somebody was running out of his cell and uh, said something I don't know in English I think it was it used to be that his father he was a Greek and uh, his father was a, um, a reader in the psalmist in the in the church so for him at that moment it was like something of his family background was just in front of his cell door. So we started talking and uh, yeah, this is, uh, at these moments you realize that the, uh, of you, were, you, you are starting being aware of the, um, um, the presence of um, the church, in people uh, representing the church is is of the utmost importance especially in places where people struggle and this is what ha ha happens to everybody exactly. especially in these times and uh, and we we, sh we should be aware of these things and uh, and i in these situations i'm starting to be aware of this too of course, it's uh, people seeing me, and then I realize, oh, yeah, that's my function. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is also a kind of awareness, which is, uh, it is their faith, which, which strengthens also my being aware of this. This is in prison. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, these, these things are, are exceptional, and uh, always thanking God for this. But, of course, I'm going... Uh, older, so there will be a time I have to finish this work, I have to do other things, probably God will give me other things to do, and uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. I'm just, I'm just looking at your, your questions, I, so yeah. I have been <laughs> I talking all, already a lot, and I, I just uh, I said something about the monastery here, and oh, by the way, the monastery is dedicated the monastery where I'm living now. So this is not in the city of Groningen, but it's even 100 kilometers away from the city. And it's a rather remote area. And uh, there used to be, uh, in the Middle Ages, there used to be a monastery in this village. It was dedicated uh, also to St. Nicholas. So when we started this monastery, we said it should be dedicated again to St. Nicholas. And to our surprise, the Protestant inhabitants of the village, it's a small village, about 400 inhabitants, they already mentioned one 
small road in the village to uh, to Nicholas, not to Saint Nicholas, because they are Protestants, they don't recognize the saint. So they have a, a, a Nicholas road. I'm always making jokes about this. Say, well, you have a Nicholas joke, but we don't know which Nicholas. We have the Saint Nicholas Monastery. So this is because of it's. We, we, there's a difference, and then you can explain to them. And um, here in the monastery, we I I received from my uh, uh, monastery where I was in Poland. I've been eight years in the Polish Orthodox. Um, in two of Polish Orthodox monasteries, and uh, I see just a book in front of me. Maybe you could give me this book. The, the, the next one, yeah, the, yeah. This is the. It's maybe nice to see. This is the monastery where I've been in Poland, mm -hmm. and I show you there is a. This is the monastery. When I came into this monastery, I'll show you. A, it's always nice to be there again. Oh, this is this is my monastery in Poland in winter time. It's very beautiful. Exactly. And uh, oh, here you can see them. Very serious looking. And let's see this Bishop Andrew. He was he was in a cell just uh, next to me. This is Archbishop Grigori. He was my uh, Ispovjetnik in the monastery, and here we have from the maybe I have a better picture of him because he's important for you in Serbia to know about him. Uh, yes, you have here him again, as you can see it. He is just under the umbrella. That's not a very good picture of him. But anyway, his name is here again. It's difficult to see them thinking on your picture. But a bit of white. He's a metropolitan, you can see. Yes. And he's called Metropolitan Sava. He finished his theological studies at uh, Bogoslovsky Fakultet in Ubeograd. And he speaks a little of Serbian as well. And I remember very well when the bombardment started on Serbia that he initiated. A um, collection of money for food packets for Serbia. We were all in the Orthodox Church, we were uh, active with these things. And this was, of course, he, he had his context over there. And he uh, did the monastic vows for me. He gave me the name Yevsevi. And uh, I asked him, Why did you give me this name Yevsevi? He said, Well, I had a, a pencil. And a calendar, and I just did this. <laughs> <laughs> I already thought, no, it's probably not, not like that. And um, very soon after this, I returned to my home country, and I was still thinking about this name, Yesevi. And uh, I already knew the feast of my uh, saint. We don't feast uh, Slavas like you, but we have the name day of our, of our saint. And this was on the on the uh, on the Apodosis, I think it's in Odanje, uh, Odanje of the Praznik Bogojavlen. And, uh, and on the same day, it's the feast day of Saint Sava of Serbia, Savada. And I thought, oh, now I see. So he wanted me to have a kind of a connection with Serbia, probably, because at that time I was already going to Serbia and was wondering about this. So the Metropolitan, who himself is called Sava, gave me a name day on his name day. Okay. So <laughs> these things you cannot organize. It's it it comes somewhere, and in this way I was connected with uh, with. with I didn't knew. I didn't know. I only when I was here I realized these things, and uh, yeah, it's interesting, yes. but more than interesting. Yeah. And do we have enough time? Yes, yes, we have. Uh, we have time. Thank you for this. Uh, let's say journey through your life. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would like to ask you about the current situation that the that the, the entire world is facing. 
of course, everybody's talking about this and we are in the middle of this uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, this pandemic influenced already our church life a lot. And uh, when I say church life, I mean uh, the worship, of course. So uh, the, the, the holy services are being broadcasted or live streamed. So people, instead of going to the, to the church, they watch it uh, online. And I know plenty of people that uh, on Sunday morning, they turn on the TV, they stand up in front of the TV and they behave like they're in the church. So this is already a, a completely new reality. So this is one uh, uh, influence of this uh, pandemic. But uh, can you comment on the, on the possible further uh, influences that will uh, happen in the church once the, the, the situation is over? Well, my, my personal comment, when it's like this, that people uh, um, looking at their uh, television or computers and, and being uh, uh, together with the, the broadcasting of a uh, holy liturgy, and when they're behaving like in church, then we return in a way to the first Christians who were behaving in their house like being in church. And there's nothing wrong about this. Um, but the other side, of course, is uh, we should be um, the distance between us and holy liturgy should be, not be this distant. And of course, I realize in, in situations of uh, uh, pandemic like now, uh, you have to be careful. In our situation, our bishop, uh, from The Hague and the Netherlands, he advised us um, to, to remind the, the liturgy of St. James. And he said, there is a special way in which you can prepare Holy Communion that there won't be any kind of direct uh, touch between connection, contact between people. Um, and as you know, the, the, the Patriarch of Russia also advised people not to come to churches, but to see on television. Um, so some of our parishes in Holland uh, do it in, in this way. They act in, the, in this way. They uh, they broadcast their uh, services on television on Sundays. I always have to go weekends to Groningen to, to be at the at celebration and to, to assist uh, where, where possible. And, uh, but we're here in the monastery, we are on a, a, well, blessed with our distance from the world. I mean, not many people coming here. So I said, uh, but this is only here. Uh, if you prepare yourself, which means uh, clean your hands, take one and a half meter distance of each other, and uh, we cannot have more than 15 uh, people uh, present at the uh, Holy Liturgy, then everything continued like normal. And uh, up till now, we had every time Holy Liturgy, and we had uh, Divine Liturgy, uh, Yesterday, we no, two days ago, we celebrated Judy uh, of and it's, yeah, it's possible. But uh, thank God, uh, I was already afraid that maybe more than 15 people would come to the, to the, the feast of St. George, but uh, there were only exactly 15. So uh, we'll see. Uh, when the measures are taking more time, uh, people probably will find out we are still having normal liturgy and they try to come here as well. And some parishes avoid this by making a list of names in which you can uh, write down your name and people have then their appointments to receive uh, Holy Communion in the church. And... Uh, Somebody already uh, mailed me and said, uh, can I be at the next Holy Liturgy, which will be next week? And she's from far away, from the south of our country. So, well, if there's not too much coming, I can continue the way I'm having a Holy Liturgy here. But if 
and there are too much coming. I have to think about this, of course, but um, it is a special situation, of course, but we as Orthodox, through history, we had so many uh, special situations. You in, 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 in Serbia, in, in, in Russia, in Greece, Romania, everywhere, Bulgaria, everywhere, there were special situations during the history of our church. And the main thing always is um, try to be as close to God as possible and don't forget the uh, holy liturgy and taking of the, the, the body and blood of Christ, this will save us. And it will even cure us. And it will even help us, especially in these difficult situations. And this is, yeah, I'm trying to explain my uh, parishioners as well, but I always say to them as well, but prepare. Not only prepare yourself spiritually, but also physically. I mean, the general physical things like keeping distance, wash your hands, uh, don't get connected with, with this virus. Be careful. Okay. But it's also spiritually. Okay. You, have always be, you should always try to be careful in this way, especially in this world. Okay, that brings me to the, to the other topic uh, that we discussed already. Uh, at least in Serbia, uh, a big discussion started uh, uh, when this pandemic starts between uh, church and non-church people. And uh, it's about, of course, the Holy Communion. For, uh, and also the discussion started among church people. Uh, that, is, that was very also interesting. Uh, for majority of church people, of course, Holy Communion is a body and blood of Christ. And uh, Christ as a source of life cannot be the source of infection. And it's very clear. But for the non-church people, of, okay, if we neglect a uh, certain amount of anti-church people that cannot wait to attack the church, okay, if we ne neg neglect them, uh, we are talking about ordinary church people, uh, non-church people, that uh, for them uh, the Holy Communion is just uh, wine and, and bread and nothing more. And they are afraid that uh, this can be the source uh, of infection. So uh, the statement that uh, the ch church might give, that, uh, for example, the church is no one forcing to take Holy Communion, for them probably is not strong enough because they think that it influences and, uh, and uh, favors the, the, the I, epidemic. I understand. So I understand. What, what should of we, uh, the, what the, should the word of Jesus Christ himself is very important in this way. Yeah, so what should he, be the, 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 the attitude of Jesus the Christ himself, he healed many, many people. And when he healed them, he often said to them, your faith has saved you, has cured you. And this is the same. Non-church people thinking about Holy Communion, they don't have faith. And when there is no faith, they won't be cured by having Holy Communion. Whereas the, the believers, they know there is spasienje in the in the holy blood and uh, body of Christ. They know, and they live, try to live according to this. But when there is no faith, you cannot expect from them that, that this will be to them. So, what to do about this? You can discuss in in in, in uh, physical things, in medical terms, in all these things. But there never will be an answer in a Christian way. And uh, yeah, the only answer is, of course, faith. And when there is no faith, there, there will no be, you cannot, you cannot expect uh, the uh, savers act towards you when you have no faith. Because you don't believe he is your savior. How can, how can it save you? This is very logical, in my opinion, and uh, in this way we could uh, we could try to explain them. But then you have, of course, the matter of uh, the government making restrictions, and uh, thank God, uh, our government uh, they have still to do with constitution, and in constitu in our constitution is written 
that uh, there should be and there must be protected religious freedom. So they cannot, in this way, they cannot interfere in the uh, sacraments. And uh, thank God. But we always should be prepared. You never know. Because, uh, well, the devil is always trying to get in between. And, uh, of course, we, uh, compared to your country, the uh, I know, and you already said, there are also non-church-going people, uh, not connected with uh, orthodoxy, even uh, opposed to this. There is always the, the communists, uh, say, uh, 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 things which were... Uh, thought in the in the past they have influence in modern Serbia as well. Uh, we in in our country uh, many people left uh, Protestant and Catholic churches. There is a uh, the, the majority they think more in terms of uh, liberalism. For them, the new God in this country is called freedom, and uh, they even changed Liberation Day, which was connected with the liberation of the, of the, the Germans uh, occupation and the fascist regime, they change it in the day of freedom. So they make a new God, which is called freedom. And we have to give our, our offerings to this new God. And we as Christians, our God is not called freedom in their way. Of course, we believe that there is freedom, but there is no freedom without God. And they think there is freedom without God. Uh, even in these days, everywhere here on the, on the uh, highways, you see these boards which, with text, together we can cope this virus. I always think when I see it, together with God. And this is also in these situations, the, 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 the case with Holy Communion. So it's uh, it is a matter of faith. And uh, I want to ask you, uh, according to the to the last uh, statistics from uh, 2017, in uh, in the Netherlands, majority of the people, let's say more than 50 percent, are non-believers. And uh, as you just said, that they have a new God that is called uh, freedom. Let's say free uh, freedom without God. So how the the are uh, Dutch people sh uh, showing any interest in orthodoxy? I mean, what is your experience in the last, I don't know, 20 years? Are they coming? Uh, uh, are, are they, are they uh, searching for the God in an orthodox way? Or this uh, progress uh, will continue with, uh, with a huge amount of uh, non-believers? Um, even for us, orthodox, when we prepare ourselves, for instance, for um, Great Lent, for Velki Post, then there is a fight inside. And this fight is also to do with freedom. But we know when we give up this part to, to come closer to God, the gift he will give us is much, much bigger than this worldly freedom. And in the world, of course, they, they don't know. And uh, that's why we are here, Orthodox Christians, just to be Orthodox Christians, which is, we don't have to go out on the streets. We don't have to, these things, it's, uh, oh, we could say something on television, but don't expect too much of this. We should talk in, in personal context with, with, with people, but being here, being there, this is already important. And giving command on your statistics, uh, yeah, it is true. There are many people uh, uh, going far away from churches, but last year, the government uh, also gave the new figures, uh, statistics of the amount of Orthodox in the Netherlands. And uh, we are already with 230,000 in the Netherlands, all Orthodox. I mean, Greek, Coptics, Eritreans, Russians, Serbians, Bulgarians. We are even bigger than the Hindustans and the Buddhists in our country. And uh, the Protestants and the Catholics, they are amazed 
because we are growing and they are diminishing. And um, I even right now have three Dutch men who like to be Orthodox. In the last 20 years, I think maybe 30, maybe 40 Dutch people uh, became Orthodox. And we don't write it in newspapers. We don't, it's written in their hearts when it's good. It's written in their hearts and they become, uh, they testify. They testify about Christ, and what it means in their lives and what the church means in them. Of course, like all Orthodox true history, one is more church going, one is more pious, one is more, these difference we have among our, our uh, Dutch Orthodox as well. But they are here, which means Orthodox is, is universal. It's everywhere. Okay. Thank God. And uh, can you, for the end, just give a, I don't know how to say it, like the final message to the, to the Serbian people? And I know that you like Serbia and that you have been here for many <laughs> times. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would like to go, after all these corona problems, I would like to go again to Serbia. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, Želim svi snage po ovo vreme i posobno želim duhovne radosti. Thank you very much. Padre Josevi, thank for this uh, conversation. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much too. And uh, once uh, this pandemic is over, I hope to, to, to meet you again. The last time yeah. we met was... Ako bog da. Ako bog da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye.